Ever since I was 10 or 11 years old, I had a dream of one day to come to the United States to college. So um, during the time when I was applying to come to this country here, uh, I didn't get any uh, kind of acceptances, notices. So I was wondering why. And one day I discovered that my, my parents had hidden those, uh, accept uh, those acceptances from me because they wouldn't allow me to overshadow my brother. Pauline Lo Alker graduated from Arizona State University with a passion for computers. Setting her sights on a programming job, she pounded the pavement for a year, but she couldn't break in anywhere. She settled for a bookkeeping position and took classes at night. In one of those classes I took, uh, I met uh, a lady who worked in the G General Electric's computer division as a uh, uh, technical public in the technical publications group as an editor. Uh, she said, well, Pauline, my department has an opening for a manuscript typist. So I rented an IBM Selectric typewriter and, for, and practiced my accuracy and speed for two weeks solid. And I went for, I applied for the job and I got the job. So two months later, a programming job opened at GE. So four people inside GE applied, plus myself. And I took a two-hour test, an interview, I got the dream job. Oh, Linda. Um, were you able to get a hold of uh, Antoine? By making her own choices, taking chances, she beat considerable odds. This country leads the world in business failures as well as business starts. So I'm not saying America is perfect. Despite her imperfections, there is no other place I'd rather be. There's no other place we can find as many opportunities to open to all sorts of people, including somebody like myself, to do what I do. All right, then. We need to get this gear aboard. Often it takes an outsider to catch a society in an accurate light. In the 1830s, French aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville visited this country to study prisons. Instead, a bustling democracy caught his eye. In our seaports, he discovered the quintessential picture of Americans at work. He recorded every detail in his journal, which became Democracy in America. The European navigator will touch at several ports, losing precious time. An American navigator leaves Boston, arrives at Canton, stays a few days there, and comes back. In less than two years, he has only once seen land. The European navigator is prudent about venturing out to sea. He only does so when the weather is suitable. At night, he furls his sails. The American, neglecting such precautions, braves these dangers. Set sail while the storm is still rambling. Americans would put something heroic into their way of trading. The universal movement prevailing in the United States and the unexpected shifts in public and private wealth all unite to keep the mind in a sort of feverish agitation, making the American enterprising, adventurous, and above all, an innovator. In Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, a group of homeless veterans gather for a town meeting of their shelter. It is a, a travesty that this country has um, a quarter of a million homeless veterans. These are men and women that fought for the rights of each of us as Americans. And for them to be sleeping under bridges and eating from dumpsters is an indictment on our democracy. It's tough when you have a home and a job and you have everything going and one day it's like gone again. You know, through being homeless, I wound up in jail. And I did a year in jail and when I came out, I didn't have anybody. You feel like you have nothing and you don't know where to begin. We felt like homeless veterans was a travesty. 
and we appealed to the players at the Veterans Administration and Department of Veterans Affairs and, and, and literally were told that there wasn't anything that anyone could do. Opportunity is about doing something when no one else will, about providing second, third, even tenth chances. Veteran Ken Smith raised funds for his answer. The New England Shelter for Homeless Veterans, housed in a former Federal Reserve Bank. We are smack in the heart of downtown Boston, and our motto is taking care of business. You come here to take care of your business. We have everything that we knew in the military. We have company commanders, supply sergeants, top sergeants, executive officers, mess sergeants. So veterans who show up here join up. It's kind of like the, the foreign legion of, of homelessness. And this is a funny situation. We got a, a lot of guys in different branches of service and we all get along. It's, real, it's a real, real good setup that we have here. It's like a second home. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's a place where you can just get your, your foot in a hole so you just be, you know, so you can step up again. You know? They're giving you focus and structure in your life. They're giving you direction. 85% of the veterans who show up here are what I call environmental alcoholics. They drink because there's nothing else to do. If you fill that time with constructive and positive things, then they bloom like winter crocuses, and they begin to uh, express their, their themselves in ways that are absolutely amazing. Miracles happen here. Miracles happen every day. This is the 197th town meeting. 4,000 brothers before you went to town meetings. Since the day we opened, we have conducted a, a town meeting. It's your opportunity to speak to the management of this facility. And that democracy is important to us because it, it helps us to continue to move forward as we listen to new and fresh ideas and listen to um, uh, criticisms about what it is that we do. You know, I understand they're working, they only got so much time to eat, but why should they get to the food before the guys that live there do it? Food comes in, it belongs to all of us. There's a lot of give and take, like the outside world. The inside rules, however, are tough. The combination works. 85% of the veterans who pass through the shelter leave clean with jobs and money in the bank. You know what I'm saying? Yes, brother. The only thing I want to say is I'm glad for this vet center right here. For the simple reason it's helping me do the things, get back on my feet. The solution lies in the community-based organizations and not in the federal government's mandates. Etched in stone on the Statue of Liberty is bring me your hungry and bring me your homeless. Well, if we're going to advertise for it, then let's have some programs about it. going somewhere is better than in a car going nowhere. So the citizens of Portland, Oregon discovered when yellow bikes started springing up around town. One person does make a difference. The yellow bike project is uh, it's about putting out bicycles for everyone to use and no one claiming ownership. A lot of our vision of what private property is, that's my bicycle, doesn't apply to the yellow bike program. Hey, it's not my bicycle, it's not your bicycle, it's everybody's and nobody's at the same time. You just get on a bike and you take it anywhere you want and you enjoy it and when you're done with it you just leave it for another person to enjoy and that's all there is to it. In 1994 the United Community Action Network aptly named You Can started putting free bikes on the street. Some bikes disappeared, some broke down, but most remained on the street. The original fleet of 15 bikes grew to more than 200 in just a few months. Tom O'Keefe found his leverage in wheels. The project started when I moved into a new neighborhood in Portland, and um, some people told me it was higher crime, so for my own curiosity, I decided to test the neighborhood, and I just left my $10 garage sale special bike in the backyard unlocked on purpose to see how long it would last lasted a month and it just clicked to me that hey maybe it's time to put out some free bikes on the streets and so it just moved forward this is 